Final ending of the camp, part one down below. I paused, letting the tension simmer before presenting my terms. I'll steer clear of legal action under certain conditions. First, my wife must remain oblivious to this discussion. Second, as for her discipline, feel free to demote or sanction her in any way, just ensure she remains employed. That's crucial for the divorce proceedings. As for the other party involved, act as you see fit. However, he seems like a recurring problem, doesn't he? Imagine if this situation involved a major benefactor or a family member of one. He seems like a liability to me. But that's just my take, handle it as you wish. We're in agreement then. Excellent. This conversation isn't officially recorded, but I've captured it here. Revealing the recorder, I handed over the tape, omitting the fact that another recording device was still active. This recording can serve as your leverage against any potential issues I might cause. There's one more point, a volunteer, Cindy Waller, she's been complicit in my wife's actions. It might be beneficial for her to no longer be part of your organization. Their nods were rapid and unanimous. In the end, my wife faced a demotion and probation but kept her employment. Cindy was notably upset when suggested she should seek opportunities elsewhere, yet she accepted the situation. I suspect Jace orchestrated this, she lamented to Becky. And if he did, it's his right. I'm sure Alan would concur, had he been honest. Remember, Cindy, we're often judged by our associations, and currently, I'm a liability. Greg was permitted to resign without accommodation. His whereabouts remain unknown, though he did bid Becky farewell. They let me go, courteously, but I'm out, without any recommendation. Guess this is farewell. Becky responded with a hint of empathy, I'm sorry, Greg, but we've brought this upon ourselves. At least you're not tied down. After a brief silence, he confessed, well, actually, I am married. She's on duty in a harsh location. She's due back in three months. You're despicable. How could you do this to her? At least Jace is safe, not in harm's way. Yes, I've been foolish. It was loneliness, and you were willing. I regret it all. You won't disclose this to her, will you? No, I don't have any means to reach out to her, and even if I could, she doesn't warrant going through what I am. When she returns, cherish her deeply, and ensure you don't make this error again. I assure you, I regret how everything unfolded. I wish you could reconcile. You are an incredible person, Becky. Farewell. Tears were audible over the call for a few moments before it ended. I contemplated reaching out to his wife, yet ultimately refrained. She deserved to know, but likely, she would discover the truth in time. Kathy facilitated a connection between Becky and me, and Becky eagerly took the opportunity to speak with me. On Kathy's advice, she attended three sessions by herself first. I believe Kathy intended to prepare her, but Becky was too determined to see that. The anticipated evening arrived. Our first meeting. Anticipating a possible confrontation, I arrived half an hour early. Becky was noticeably surprised when Kathy escorted her from the lobby and saw me already there. Jace, she exclaimed, attempting to embrace me. Kathy stepped in between us. Becky, for this to be successful, you must respect his boundaries. He has made it clear that he doesn't want any physical contact. If you don't adhere to the guidelines I've established, he'll depart and not return. Got it. After a brief moment, she composed herself and took a seat across the table. Becky, listen. I understand you have things to express, and so does Jace. Remember, stay composed, articulate clearly, and avoid overreacting. Would you like to start? She nodded, and we began. Firstly, I owe you an apology, Jace. What I did was inexcusable. You have every right to be upset. I can't justify my actions. I'm not even certain why I behaved that way. Was it worth the agony I'm experiencing? Absolutely not. Would I ever make such an egregious mistake again? Never. But Kathy has made me realize that merely being remorseful and apologizing won't suffice if you can't forgive me. I admit I made a grave mistake that ruined a wonderful marriage. Now, I need to persuade you to consider giving me another chance. Can you promise to at least speak with me? If, after these sessions, you still can't forgive me, I'll accept it and won't contest the divorce. I observed both of them. Perhaps those solo sessions were beneficial after all. I began, sensing her anticipation for my response. I realize it's hard for you, Beck. I've been pondering over the past few days. Think about the couples we know who faced infidelity and sought counseling to salvage their marriage. How many succeeded? Only one pair, Gary and Sherry. And even they seem changed, less affectionate in public than before. It's been two years, yet they haven't fully recovered. Can you imagine us like that? Always under a cloud of doubt, me questioning your every move, verifying your stories, checking your belongings and devices. I couldn't bear it. She visibly recoiled at my words, yet her expression remained resolute. If it means I can be close to you every night, I'd endure it, she asserted. I'd do whatever it takes to prove I'm trustworthy again. I exhaled in frustration, throwing up my hands. There's the issue, trust. How can we rebuild that? You were dishonest even before we fully committed to each other. I overlooked it back then. Now, after all these years, planning a life together, you've strayed again. Was it loneliness or boredom this time? While I was focused on our future, you chose a different path. Releasing these pent-up feelings was cathartic. Becky looked shell-shocked as Kathy intervened. Time's up, Kathy announced. 
For next session, Becky, think about Jace's words. Plan how you'll regain his trust. Jace, consider whether you can move past your anger and give the relationship another chance. Be candid about it. That's all for today. Jace, may I speak with you briefly before you go? Good night, Becky. We observed her drive away, pausing for a long moment before departing. Kathy turned to me, her expression somber. You've decided against reconciliation, haven't you? I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and sorrow. Kathy sighed. I thought so. We need to adjust our approach, prepare her for this. If there's any affection left, let her down gently. Attempting to resolve our issues proved futile. Kathy and I gave it our all, yet it seemed like hitting a brick wall. Despite employing every strategy at our disposal, understanding remained elusive. Eventually, I ceased trying. You broke your deepest promise, Beck, and it seemed effortless for you. Even now, you seem to regret the consequences, but I sense a lack of gravity in your understanding of the act. You treated it as trivial, akin to overspending or a minor accident, whereas I saw it as transformative. Didn't it resonate with you at all? Her response remained evasive as ever, crying out for emotional expression. Yet you're the one who's become unyielding. Can't we try once more? How can you remain so detached while I'm unraveling? You're missing the point. Emotion surges through me. It's emotion that distinguishes us, enabling us to experience love, frustration, passion. Other beings may think, but it's humans who feel deeply. I've simply learned to manage these feelings better. After she spoke for another half hour, I signaled a pause and stood up. It's over, Beck. Acceptance and moving forward are necessary now. I still hold affection for you, but it's insufficient. The divorce will be finalized in a month. It's better for us both. You have so much life ahead, and you'll find someone new. Remember us if you ever face temptation again. He will merit your utmost. Exiting, I felt my heart shatter anew at her cry. Kathy contacted me two days later. I've just had a session with Becky. Although I can't divulge details, she's still hopeful about reconciling. Be cautious, she might try to approach you. I'm genuinely sorry for how things turned out. Maybe continue therapy a bit longer. Shall we schedule a session? I pondered briefly. Not now. I'll reach out in a few weeks. Thanks for everything, Kathy. Indeed, Kathy's prediction came true. There was one last endeavor before relinquishment. Despite my fondness for her family, her eldest brother was the exception. His profession in law enforcement and his domineering nature strained our interactions. His routine stops, under the guise of authority, were attempts to coerce reconciliation with his sister. After consulting with Paul and documenting these incidents, the officer had to justify his actions to his superiors, leading to the cessation of the stops and no improvement in his sentiment towards me. It was a couple of weeks away from the final court date. The sunlight was radiant, indicating the arrival of spring, and for the first time in ages, I felt a sense of joy. That said a morning, as I rode my Yamaha, the sudden flashing of police lights in my mirror signaled me to pull over. As I reached for my license, still not making eye contact, the officer suddenly restrained me with a stun gun, handcuffed me, and placed me in the back of his patrol car. Regaining my senses, we stopped at a local park where he aggressively dragged me out, continuing my protests, and secured me to a bench with handcuffs. He then connected Becky to me with the same set of cuffs. He sharply told us he expected cooperation and would return shortly. While I tried to regain my composure, Becky nervously chattered, trying to explain the situation. Can we talk now, dear? Searching her face, I tried to see the woman I once loved. She seemed different now. Seems I don't have much choice, I responded with a forced smile. Just pass me my phone. I was supposed to meet someone, and then you have my full attention, okay? She handed me my phone, and I immediately called emergency services. 911, what's your emergency? My name is JC, Gooding. I'm at Armstrong Park, on the south bench near the gazebo. I've been forcibly detained and handcuffed to a bench and another individual. I need assistance. Becky, panicking, attempted to snatch the phone from me, her voice rising in alarm. The park was bustling with people, some of whom started to approach us. The person responsible is Shift Commander Jeff Sterling, and I'm handcuffed to his sister. Please hurry. The response was swift, a police car arrived within minutes. Becky was still in distress, trying to explain as the officer worked to free us. Her brother arrived shortly after, driving hastily onto the scene and causing a stir among the park goers. I've got this under control, I assured the officer, who hesitated, eyeing me cautiously. Handing me over to him could implicate you as well. You might face imprisonment or certainly lose your job. Better call someone higher up in command. He made the call, and soon, we were encircled by six police vehicles. No arrests were made immediately, pending further investigation, and I was escorted back to my motorcycle. The turmoil erupted the following day. The fool had recorded everything on his dash camera, my approach, his threat with a taser and handcuffs, and the entire ordeal until he forced me into the vehicle. I had the option to file charges for assault, abduction, and unauthorized use of a police car, among other accusations. Becky would face charges as an accomplice. Accompanied by Paul, we met with the district attorney to discuss the matter. My client proposes a simple resolution. 
He'll refrain from pressing charges provided the officer faces internal discipline, and his spouse agrees to abstain from attending their final divorce proceeding and to cut all communication with him. The decision is yours, but should you decline, we'll pursue legal action vigorously, understood. They were cornered. Their family was desperate to avoid seeing two of their children in prison, so they conceded to our terms. Her brother suffered consequences, though. Demoted and relegated to night shifts, he was formally censured, and his prospects for future promotion were bleak. Resignation wasn't an option, as no other department would consider hiring him. Eventually, everything settled. I returned to my thriving business and met a charming, youthful woman who saw the goodness in me, reigniting my belief in the world's beauty. In reality, I lost my friends, my business, and my spouse. It took time before I could even consider dating again. My company floundered as our predicament became public, resulting in a loss of contracts. Fortunately, Ada received a well-deserved job offer and took her protege with her, then resigned shortly after. Entering my office the next month, I found a note on the door. You win, you scoundrel. Alan secured another job, and the dissolution papers are on your desk. Sign them, and the company's closure will be finalized. The letter was unsigned, yet I instantly recognized it as Cindy's handiwork. Surprisingly, a bit of cash was left over. Following the sale of our shared property, my financial situation was quite comfortable. In fact, I could afford to take a sabbatical for a year, but I settled for a two-month break, hopped on my road star, and set off to explore. My journey took me three states away, to a region south of the Mason-Dixon line. There, I discovered one of the most picturesque cities nestled among mountains, inhabited by warm people and an easygoing vibe reminiscent of the 60s. After spending three days there, indulging in tourist activities and some personal research, I continued my travel, but no other place resonated with the same charm. Thus, I returned, rented a place for a week, and began searching for a permanent home. Preferring the privacy and space of a standalone house, I eventually settled on a quaint cottage, complete with a sprawling yard and a serene stream, and secured a lease with an option to purchase. My next step was to find employment, which led me to a small but ambitious firm. They tested my capabilities with a few minor accounts, and within six months, my performance prompted a conversation with the boss. He revealed that he had investigated my credentials and was impressed enough to offer me a significant new project. He introduced me to a local vintner, a well-traveled individual who had returned home to manage his family's farm, converting it into a successful vineyard. This entrepreneur, now managing expanded acreage and earning accolades for his sweet wines, aimed to elevate his brand to a national level. With a distribution deal in place, he needed a strong marketing strategy to highlight his offerings. This new assignment presented an exciting challenge and an opportunity to contribute to a growing business. I swung by unannounced for a wine tasting. The selection was impressive, a few didn't hit the mark for me. After sampling, I sought out Mr. Edwards. He arrived in work attire, questioning my lack of an appointment. I explained, I was eager to experience your wines and understand your operations firsthand, to brainstorm some ideas. I didn't expect an immediate meeting, just wanted to introduce myself and arrange a future appointment. How do you find my wines? He appeared eager. I enjoyed most of them, although I'm hardly an expert. I was so taken by them that I purchased an assorted case. As we conversed, an idea started forming in my mind, igniting my enthusiasm to flesh it out further. However, Jack had other plans, guiding me through the winery, detailing the origins and processes. My brief visit turned into a three-hour tour. Outside of work, I indulged in local explorations, pushing my roadstar along the serpentine mountain roads. After some modifications, its performance had noticeably improved. I acquired a second-hand four-wheel drive, anticipating the heavy snowfall here. My trusty Dodge Dart, with its turbo features, remained my primary vehicle, rarely pushing its limits. My vehicles were well sheltered, with the bike and car in the garage, and the truck outdoors. On a leisurely setting, I stumbled upon a secluded bar, frequented by a mix of motorcycles. Intrigued, I stopped for a drink. The silence that greeted me hinted at my outsider status. I ordered a beer and surveyed the surroundings. The bar, steeped in history yet well-maintained, hosted a close-knit crowd. The bartender shared that the bar, a family heirloom for 70 years, prided itself on its peaceful, respectful environment. I complimented him, recognizing the importance of a place where one could unwind, surrounded by either the formality of suits and dresses or the casualness of jeans and short skirts. At the end of the day, everyone was fundamentally the same, regardless of their financial status. He appreciated the compliment, offered to buy the next round, and then excused himself. A large man with a beard occupied the stool beside me. Is it your bike? He inquired, glancing out at my motorcycle. Yes, he chuckled dismissively. Just another imported bike, huh? Don't they have classic American bikes where you're from? His smile softened the jab. Which one's yours? I queried. He gestured towards a well-worn Harley. Nice bike, I commented with a smile. The front forks are Italian, the carburetors, if original, are from Japan, and the tires, assuming they're standard, 
are from a British company produced in France. Still think it's purely American. He looked at me, surprised. I confirmed with a nod. Really, but they're still great bikes. Soon, half the bar joined our conversation. One individual mentioned his Vulcan was domestically produced. We went outside to admire the bikes, and by the time we returned, I felt like I was part of their circle. I found myself frequenting the bar on weekends, participating in poker runs, and enjoying group rides whenever the mood struck. The group introduced me to many hidden gems I would have never discovered on my own. Three months in, I earned my nickname. I had visited Jack Edwards to discuss a potential campaign. I suggested shooting a commercial in his winery's tasting room, which was a blend of wood, stone, and glass, bathed in natural light. He agreed, proposing Monday for the shoot due to lower sales activity, and generously offered me a case of his wine for feedback. Many of his wines bore names reflecting local features. Millrace Red was inspired by the historic mill near his vineyard. Yankee Orchard White paid homage to a friend's apple orchard, known for its unique and novel apple varieties. One of his blends, using juice from pink lady apples, combined with a medium white wine, offered a smooth taste, reminiscent of fresh apples with a subtle grape flavor. It had been an exhausting day, and I was in dire need of some relaxation. Coincidentally, my route home passed right by the local bar. Without thinking about my attire, I entered. The place fell silent for a brief moment before erupting in laughter and playful teasing. Look who's here. Been to a board meeting. Joked Fat Bob, the first person I had befriended when I discovered this spot. Our friendship had grown to the point where I'd lend him my truck whenever his motorcycle needed repairs and had to be taken to the shop. I was about to respond when another voice cut through the noise. Who's the corporate guy? I recognized the voice instantly. It was Amanda Patterson, or Baby Doll as she was known here, a nickname stemming from her youthful appearance and petite stature. She was a fiery redhead with a quick temper, yet she held a certain charm. Babadol was like the bar's unofficial mascot, and she commanded respect, making it clear she wasn't to be trifled with unless she showed interest, which was a rare occurrence. Hey, Amanda, I dressed up just to pop the question. I quipped, dropping to one knee amidst the uproarious laughter of the patrons. She turned a brilliant shade of red, her temper flaring. Her disdain for love and marriage was no secret, hinting at some deeper past experiences, and she loathed being called by her full name. Not funny, jerk. And why are you all laughing? Don't make me come over there. Her outburst only fueled the laughter. I'll take that as a maybe, I continued playfully. Should I stay in this suit until you agree to turn my life around? She shoved me playfully and stormed off to the kitchen. Fat Bob helped me to my feet, chuckling. Better skip ordering tonight. She might add a special seasoning to it, he whispered. Babe all occasionally helped in the kitchen on weekends, earning her keep with tips and meals. Ellen, one of the bartenders, shared that Amanda had faced tough times, was financially strapped, and resorted to staying at a women's shelter during the week while crashing on a cot in the bar's back room over the weekend. It wasn't strictly above board, but it was a well-kept secret. She's really a decent person, just facing hard times. We'd give her a regular job here if finances allowed. Curious, I inquired about her weekday meals and her lack of a steady job. Soup kitchens, I assume. I never really inquired. I believe she has a troubled past with the law, hasn't completed her high school education, lacks personal transportation, and that narrows her job opportunities considerably. Amanda was a constant presence there, staying until the last minute to secure a place to sleep at night. I'm not sure what drove me to do it. Perhaps I sought a human connection, or maybe I aimed to offer her a glimmer of hope. I negotiated with Helen and Sam, the proprietors, agreeing to cover her meal expenses during the week. Sam consented to employ her for waiting tables and tidying up, four hours each evening for a weekly payment of $100 in cash, half of which I contributed. I insisted on anonymity regarding my financial involvement. Here, I said, handing Ellen $200, take her out to buy some new clothes. She can repay you from her earnings, 20 a week. Ellen shared that it was the first time she witnessed her cry. Her purchases were modest, new undergarments, three pairs of affordable jeans, four simple t-shirts, and two pairs of discounted sneakers. Reflecting on Ellen's account, I realized Becky would often spend more on a single item of clothing she barely liked, using it a few times before discarding it. Likely, Becky's monthly expenditure on cosmetics and accessories far exceeded Amanda's earnings. She remained behind in the kitchen for the evening. Helen later mentioned she seemed emotional, attributing it to the onion chopping. I regretted if I had unintentionally upset her. Thus, I earned the moniker suit, which everyone found amusing. I made it a habit to visit in my office attire whenever possible. Each time, I would jestingly inquire if she had reconsidered, despite her playful scolding. She now responded with a smile. The regulars at the bar were fond of her. It wasn't until one evening, when a newcomer made unwelcome advances, that I truly considered her feelings. She handled his persistence with a forced smile, but the situation escalated when he inappropriately touched her. Reacting instantly, I intervened as she retaliated by splashing her drink in his face. Get lost, he snarled, gearing up to strike her. I swiftly pulled him away. Sam and another patron intervened, preventing any further altercation. 
Amanda fiercely made it clear to him never to touch her again, mistakenly referring to me as her fiancé in the heat of the moment. She was visibly embarrassed by her slip of the tongue and retreated to the kitchen, only to emerge later to express her gratitude for my assistance, to which I responded with a grin. I couldn't let my future wife get injured, could I? I understand you didn't intend it, but maybe it's a good idea to let those annoying guys know you're taken. Just think about it. Her response was to give me a quick kiss on the cheek, which caused quite a stir in the bar. After the noise subsided, she warned them playfully not to tease her and her boyfriend again. This prompted laughter, and she quickly retreated to the kitchen. Three weeks later, I participated in a charity bike ride. We gathered at the bar where they served breakfast in the kitchen. After eating, as everyone was getting ready to leave, I felt a gentle pull on my sleeve. She looked shy yet determined. Can I join you on the ride? Why not? I replied, do you have a helmet? She showed me one, borrowed it from a friend. Dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, she looked unprepared for the morning chill. You should grab a jacket, it's going to be chilly, I advised. She looked down, I don't own one, never needed it. I let out a small sigh, and she climbed on the bike, cautiously keeping her hands to herself. Have you ridden a motorcycle before? She nodded. You'll need to hold on, don't worry, I'll be careful. It's safer that way. It was well known she disliked being touched, but she hesitantly wrapped her arms around my waist. I started off gently until she seemed more at ease. After a short distance, I veered into a store's parking lot. Why are we stopping here? To pick up a jacket for you. You're shivering, and I can feel it. You can repay me later if you like, or consider it my treat for joining me today. But we're not leaving until you're properly outfitted. She grumbled and protested, but I ushered her inside and provided her with a cozy jacket and scarf, even throwing in a pair of gloves, which only increased her complaints. If you don't quiet down, I'll leave you here. You need these to stay healthy, I don't want your stubbornness to make you ill. Now, give me a smile and appreciate my kindness. She gave a half-smile, sarcastically thanking me. Sure, if you feel like wasting your money, go ahead. Are we ready to catch up with the others now? We rejoined our friends at the second checkpoint, where she had settled in close to me, holding on tightly. When we reached the lunch stop at a buffet-style restaurant, she pretended she'd rather stay with the bike. I whispered to her firmly, get inside the restaurant, now. Otherwise, I'm carrying you in myself. Understand. She nodded, clearly annoyed but ended up enjoying the meal. By the day's end, she had softened up. We even won a $100 gift certificate at a Harley dealership, which I handed to her, playfully covering her mouth to stop her objections for a moment. However, the mood shifted on our way back as it began to drizzle, turning into a steady rain. Close to my place, but still a distance from the bar, I decided to head home. Upon arriving, she angrily discarded her new jacket, gloves, and scarf in the garage, along with the gift certificate, her expression one of fury and misunderstanding. She accused me of having ulterior motives for my gifts, which she vehemently rejected before storming out. It took me some time to gather myself before I drove after her in the rain. When I found her, I offered her a ride back to the bar, warning that I was ready to bring her back by force if necessary. Hoping she would choose to come willingly, she attempted to squeeze by me. You wouldn't have the guts. People like you don't do that kind of stuff. I was significantly larger and quite agitated. In a moment, I had her pressed against the car, my hand striking her firmly. She yelled, startled more than hurt. After a few more strikes, she pleaded for me to halt. I'll get in the car. I'll behave, I promise. Please, stop. I had cooled off by then and felt a bit remorseful. Releasing her, I opened the car door for her. She quickly got inside. We had driven a short distance when she began to speak. I raised my hand. Silence, or I'll stop the car and continue. Then I'll leave you right there. Got it. She nodded, clearly frightened. Arriving at the parking lot, I leaned over to open her door. Get out. Now. She complied. After slamming the door, I drove off swiftly. Three weeks passed before I returned, timing it after her departure. Handing Helen the coat, scarf, and gloves, I said, these are for Amanda. She can use them, destroy them, or whatever she pleases. It doesn't matter to me. Helen and Sam stared at me, astonished. Then Helen, with a smirk, slapped me. Why did you do that? I inquired, touching my cheek. That's for leaving us with her non-stop wailing for three weeks. We were puzzled by your sudden absence. Then Babadol arrived, retreated to the back room, and sobbed for days. It took a while, but she finally shared her story. She's led a tough life, mistreated and forsaken at 15. She moved through foster homes until she turned 18, then ended up on the streets. It seems she met a cruel man who exploited her. Be gentle with her, suit. She's not used to someone who's genuinely kind and considerate. It's an unfamiliar notion to her. She suspects that if someone shows kindness, they're after something, often something she's reluctant to offer. She paused, a smile spreading across her face. She rushes to the door at the sound of a motorcycle, hoping it's you. She'd never admit it, but she's really taken with you. Her complaints have turned to soft sighs. Give her some slack. Make an appearance while she's around, offer a friendly word, before she's too frustrated with everyone in the bar. The following evening, I drove to the bar in the dark, dressed in a suit. Amanda, come out here. 
She appeared from the kitchen, a look of apprehension on her face. I softened my voice. Come here, I just want to have a chat. She hesitantly stepped into the bar area, looking like she might bolt at any moment. I had already spoken to Sam and Helen, so they were in on the plan. Sam, let her know she's off duty tonight. Her complexion turned ghostly, and Helen chuckled. Just for tonight, dear. Your job is safe. Exactly. You're still part of the team, just taking a break this evening. We're going out. I'll take you somewhere where the food is a bit more upscale. Hey, Sam and Helen protested in unison, but with smiles. Let me clarify. To a place where a burger and fries aren't the main course. Then, maybe catch a movie, something sentimental that you might enjoy. Go freshen up while I grab a beer. The crowd chuckled, and she blushed, nervously adjusting her clothes. Jace, I'm not really dressed for. Ten minutes, Amanda, or we revisit that rainy night scenario. Got it. She hurried off to the back room. Turning to Helen, I said, help her out, lend her some of your makeup, make her feel special. It's just dinner and a movie. She took everyone by surprise when she gave me a warm, enthusiastic hug. Maybe to you, she quipped. The group was impressed as she appeared, her cheeks flushed with excitement. Helen had styled her hair and applied a touch of lipstick, enhancing her natural beauty. I guided her by placing her hand under my arm, holding the door for her as our friends smiled approvingly. They watched from the doorway as I opened the car door for her and ensured she was comfortably seated, their muffled cheers following us as we drove off. Any particular place you'd like to dine? I inquired while we cruised along the road, my excitement speeding up the drive. She had been quiet. Anywhere is fine, she murmured, gazing out the window. I stopped the car in a nearby parking lot. Look at me, Amanda, I said gently. She turned to face me. I value direct answers. So, where would you really like to eat? Maybe try something new. Italian, Thai, whatever you fancy. She hesitated, then spoke softly. I've always been curious about lobster, but it might be expensive. Ignoring her concern about the cost, I took her to a place known for its seafood variety, treating her to a lobster dish served in three styles. Initially hesitant, she gradually became more at ease, even offering me a taste at one point. I actually don't care much for lobster, I confessed. Her confusion was clear. Then why come here? It's because you wanted to try it. And don't worry, I'm quite happy with the shrimp, I reassured her, which seemed to lighten her mood. She eagerly shared my shrimp when offered. Our evening continued with a visit to the cinema, where she chose from eight movie options surprisingly opting for a horror film. Later, at an ice cream parlor, she indulged in a generous banana split, which we shared. The night was unfolding perfectly until we drove past a bank displaying the time and temperature on a large screen. Oh no, I exclaimed suddenly. What's wrong? She asked, concerned. Oh no, I've missed the cutoff for the shelter. Looks like you'll have to take me back to the bar. Sure thing, I replied, and instead, I drove us to my place. She seemed unsure as I turned off the engine and we heard the garage door shut. Amanda, listen carefully. I have an extra bedroom here. It's yours for tonight. It even has a lock. You can sleep comfortably, take a shower in the morning, and I'll make breakfast. No strings attached, you owe me nothing. It's your choice. I'm heading in now. If you feel uneasy, just lock the door and stretch out in the car. I'll come to wake you up in the morning. After half an hour, she decided to come inside. Which way to the bedroom? I showed her to her room, where the towels were, offered her a shirt to sleep in, and then I went to lock my own door, chuckling to myself. She must be a deep sleeper because I managed to shower, get dressed, and prepare breakfast before knocking on her door. Morning, sleepyhead, breakfast is ready. I served the coffee, the ham and cheese omelet, and toast, and sat waiting. Just when I was about to give up, she wandered into the kitchen, wearing my oversized tea. She seemed tiny in it. Her grogginess didn't affect her hunger, though, she ate everything. After breakfast, we left the dishes and I grabbed my travel mug. Where should I drop you off? She seemed taken aback. Not sure. I usually spend time at the library until work starts, but that's not for another couple of hours. Maybe the park is fine. I didn't like the sound of that. The park was a haven for the homeless at that hour, and it didn't seem right for her to be there. How about this? You stay here. I'll go to work in the truck, and we can meet up when I'm done. You can use the dart to get back to the bar. Just take care, all right. Her eyes widened in surprise. You trust me that much. I smiled playfully. You planning to take something from me? Her cheeks flushed with color. I interrupted before she could speak. I didn't think so. Actually, I need to get the oil changed. Could you take it to the Dodge dealership for me? It's all paid for, so no worries about cost. I'll call them when they open. Can you do it if they have a slot available? She just nodded, looking surprised. I gave her a quick peck on the cheek, stepping back before she could respond. Thanks, dear. I'll call as soon as I know more. Feel free to watch TV and eat whatever you want. See you later. As I left, she was still touching the spot where I'd kissed her. At work, people noticed I was in a great mood. The secretary, who had shown interest in me when I first joined, asked with a hint of sarcasm if I had a fun night. I took a moment, finishing my coffee before replying. Well, Gail, I did spend the evening with an energetic young redhead. Quite refreshing, you know. 
It's a wonder I'm even able to stand today. She was speechless, while the others chuckled around us. She ended up getting the oil changed for me. When I went home to change clothes, I was struck by how clean everything was. The place was spotless, she must have worked on it all day. Later, my friend came over to give me a ride to pick up my car, wearing a big grin. What's the grin for? Is it true about you and the new girl? She seems quite a catch. I just smiled at him. You've got quite the imagination. She just had a peaceful night's sleep, nothing more. He just laughed, still wearing that grin. I wasn't ready for the whirlwind that hit me when we arrived. She sprinted towards me, leaped into my arms, and planted a hearty kiss on me. A surge of excitement rushed through me so intensely I half expected to find my shoes smoking. The bar erupted in noise. Quiet down. She shouted, her voice ringing with pride. This is how a woman greets her man. Her display of affection caught me off guard. She clung to me every chance she got, so much so that Sam threatened to fire her if she didn't start working. As I was about to leave, she pleaded for me to stay a little longer and drive her back to her place. I couldn't say no. I started the car and waited. She emerged with a large backpack, which I stowed in the trunk. What's all this? It's all I have, she replied, sliding into the seat beside me. I can't leave it at the shelter, it'd be gone in an instant. I pondered her precarious situation as we drove. When I bypassed the turn to the shelter, she became anxious. I need to get there soon, or I'll have nowhere to sleep tonight. Don't worry, you won't be sleeping there tonight. You have a room at my place. You helped me out a lot today, think of it as a thank you. She hesitated, then changed the subject by turning the radio to a station playing music I wasn't fond of, turning it up loud. That evening, instead of heading straight to bed, she showered, changed into one of my shirts, and lounged on the sofa, flipping through TV channels. Hey, I was watching that show. It was dull, suit, and I'm the guest here. She settled on a drama series about four women sharing a secret. I couldn't stand it for long. If you're going to watch mind-numbing TV, I'm off to bed before it rubs off on me. Good night, Amanda. The television was still blaring as I drifted to sleep. The next morning, she was at my door, knocking loudly. Breakfast time, sleepyhead, she echoed my words from yesterday, it's best eaten hot. Sausage, home fries, and grits were not my usual breakfast, as I was not from the south, but they were starting to grow on me. You don't have much food here, do you? She inquired while I was eating. Just a single guy, hardly home, so no need to stock up, I responded, taking another bite of the sausage. After I finished eating, she cleared the dishes. Do you need a lift tonight? I asked her as I headed out. I have the night off, she replied, but don't worry about me, I've got plans. Will I see you later? She flashed a smile. Maybe, have a great day. Throughout the day, I couldn't stop thinking about her. She was starting to affect me. Since Becky, I'd been on a few dates, but nothing serious. Just casual encounters to stave off loneliness. Reflecting on it, I questioned whether my interest in her was out of sympathy or genuine attraction. I pondered the pros and cons of pursuing a relationship with her. She was much younger, making me feel guilty, as if I was taking advantage. She was brash, loud, often exasperating, and we seemed to have little in common. Her temper was quick, and she often acted impulsively. Yet, when she was vulnerable, there was a sweetness and tenderness about her. She was intelligent and strong, facing a tough situation with grace. I admired her resilience and thought she would make a caring and protective parent. Imagining her strength during challenging times made me smile. Despite her lack of awareness, she had an innate beauty that could shine if nurtured, a beauty that was more than skin deep. Driving home, I was curious about where she might be, feeling sad at the thought of her in a difficult situation. She deserved so much more. Entering the house, an enticing aroma welcomed me. She appeared from the kitchen, her hair tied back, wearing an apron, and surprised me with a peck on the cheek, leaving me in silent admiration. Hi, honey, how was work? She managed to say before her laughter took over, amused by my bewildered look. Then, her demeanor shifted to seriousness. I've prepared dinner. It's nothing extravagant, I can cook decently, but I haven't had much chance to hone my skills recently. It'll be ready in about 30 minutes. Why don't you sit down? Can I get you a beer, or would you prefer tea? We need to have a conversation after dinner. I could see the resolve in her eyes, signaling the importance of what she had to say. Tea is good, thanks. Need a hand with anything? I offered. No, it's all under control. Just relax, she responded, a hint of relief in her voice. Dinner was delightful, roast pork, potatoes seasoned with basil and rosemary, asparagus, and freshly baked bread. It was perhaps the best meal I had ever enjoyed. I overindulged and felt a bit sheepish, but her smile reassured me. I'll take that as a compliment. Shall we move on to dessert? She had prepared banana pudding, a southern delicacy I had grown fond of. After dinner, feeling almost too full to move, I retreated to the living room while she tidied up. Then, she came in, pulling a chair close to where I was sitting. Did you enjoy the meal? Is everything clean to your liking? The place looked spotless, and the meal was fantastic. How did you become such an amazing cook? Her expression turned melancholy for a moment. My mother taught me everything she knew in the kitchen before she lost her battle with addiction. I felt a strong urge to comfort her. She quickly composed herself and looked at me determinedly. John, I'd like to propose something. 
I want to rent a room here. I can pay you weekly, help with the cooking, cleaning, laundry, and even take care of the lawn. I promise I won't be in your way. These past few days have been the happiest I've been in a while, and I dread the thought of going back to the shelter. Can we make this work? Her eyes were filled with hope, waiting for my response. No, her expression deflated, tears welling up. I'll gather my belongings. Can you take me to the shelter? No, you'll stay until we've talked. Sit down, listen, and don't interrupt. Agreed. Her face showed a mix of fear and anticipation as she nodded. I'm willing to have you stay here, but with certain rules. First, you won't pay rent. Instead, you'll keep the house clean, handle the groceries, and cook. Second, I'll manage the yard work. Third, continue your job at the bar. You can use the dart for work and errands. Lastly, and most importantly, you need to pursue your education again, either complete your high school diploma or get a jet. She was visibly taken aback, her educational gaps clearly a sore point. But this could be the push she needed. After a pause, she agreed, I'll do it. Can you help me with the schooling, though? I smiled, relieved. I'll support you in every way, except doing the work for you. Do we have an agreement? In a burst of emotion, she hugged me, then quickly pulled back, blushing. Sorry, she muttered, cheeks aflame. There's one more thing, I added with a grin. A good night kiss each evening and another before I leave for work. No exceptions. Her face lit up with a smile, and we shook hands, sealing our new arrangement. The next day, after reimbursing her for groceries and entrusting her with my debit card for future shopping, I headed to work, the joy of our morning farewell lingering. That day, even Gail's snide remarks at work couldn't dampen my spirits. When she sneered about my new living arrangement, I simply suggested she might find joy in companionship too. Her expression as I departed could have turned fresh cream sour. At the bar, the regulars teased me, yet their smiles betrayed affection. Sam gave me a firm handshake, and Helen pecked my cheek. You're a stand-up guy, suit. I always figured she'd win you over. We're just sharing a place, Helen. Nothing more, I protested. Her smile only broadened. Sure, if you say so. Amanda's face lit up with joy upon seeing me. I was about to grab a burger when she intervened. I've left dinner for you in the fridge. Just heat it up for three minutes. Hope you enjoy it. After enjoying a single beer and playing a round of pool with Fat Boy, I returned home to a delightful meal. Amanda finished her shift at 9.30 and arrived home by 10, heading straight for a shower. I reeked of greasy food, she explained, emerging in a robe, her hair wrapped in a towel. What's on TV? Our life together settled into a comforting routine. I handled the outdoor chores and car washing, while she took care of the indoors. She was the primary cook, but I made sure we dined out or enjoyed a grilled meal once a week. On beautiful Sundays, we'd take rides, either solo or with friends. She reluctantly accepted the moniker Mrs. Suit, though always with a smirk. Her 21st birthday arrived, and I organized a surprise celebration at the bar, complete with gifts, which moved her to tears, a rare show of vulnerability from her. She embraced everyone in gratitude, to everyone's surprise. I gifted her a spa day, complete with a beauty makeover, and a shopping spree at a high-end store. It would be nice to see you in something besides jeans, I joked, causing her to blush. Helen nudged me, suggesting it was time to make a more serious commitment. I'm not sure how she feels about me, I admitted. Then you're the most clueless guy around. She adores you but doesn't know how to express it. You need to guide her. It will be rewarding. How are you so wise? She embraced Sam upon his arrival. Fifteen years ago, that was me. But then I met Sam, and over time, he showed me the world had good men, and I just hadn't met one until him. I had been part of a rough group for three years. They treated me poorly, and I believed that's what I deserved. They impacted me deeply, to the point I couldn't have children. But Sam loved me regardless. How could I resist? Our age gap is even more significant than yours and Amanda's, yet we've thrived. Take the chance, suit. You won't regret it. Based on what you've shared, she's entirely different from your ex. I had shared some details about my past relationship with Becky around six months earlier, during a dinner when we hosted them and Amanda had to step out to the store. Amanda was excelling in her studies. Encouraged by me, she decided to pursue a complete high school diploma instead of a JED. We figured she would be ready to graduate in two more months. The school held graduation ceremonies twice yearly to honor their achievements. While some graduates were older, many were like Amanda, young people who had slipped through the cracks. I promised her a celebration for her graduation. I was stunned when she wore the birthday gift I gave her, a tasteful sundress in striking white, complemented with earrings and a necklace, a rare sight on her, and three-inch platform sandals. Her hair was styled in a free-flowing manner, cascading down her back. Her beauty was overwhelming. What do you think? She asked, spinning around, was it worth it? I blurted out the first thought that came to mind. They've only highlighted what's already there, sweetheart. You've always been stunning. The person who ends up with you will be the most fortunate in the world. She halted her spin, her eyes brimming with tears, and she rushed into her room. I wondered anxiously what I had said wrong. The following week, she returned from school with a light-hearted laugh. What's going on? I inquired, relieved to see her cheerful demeanor. I was approached by this charming person I had been chatting with intermittently over the past month. 
It felt like a sharp pain pierced my heart when I heard it. My response was a simple, subdued oh, as I turned away. Their reaction was swift and intense. Is that all you're going to say? Just oh. They challenged. Feeling cornered, I retorted, what do you expect me to say? You seem interested, given all the playful banter over the past month. Why would I stand in your way? They stormed off to their room, the door banging shut behind them. I exhaled deeply, a sense of fatigue washing over me as this kind of scene had become all too common. The door might need fixing if this continued. Attempts to talk were met with silence, so I resigned myself to the sofa with a beer, sinking into my thoughts. By the time I was on my third drink, I was lost in contemplation, eventually drifting to sleep. A gentle shake on my shoulder woke me up. Squinting, I managed a groggy what? Then came the dreaded phrase, we need to talk, making me instantly tense. That sentence never preceded anything positive. Do you have feelings for me? They asked, their expression unreadable. Yes, I do, I replied sincerely. To what extent? They pressed. I'm not sure what you're looking for here, Amanda. Help me understand, I said, feeling bewildered. Their frustration boiled over, and I felt a sharp sting on my face as they vented. Nursing my cheek, I listened as they poured out their feelings. I want to know if you love me, not just as a friend, but deeply and romantically. Because I've felt that way about you for a long time, and it's like you've never noticed. I know there are differences between us, I'm younger, less experienced, socially awkward, loud, jealous, fearful, and that's just scratching the surface. I can't stand this anymore. If you don't feel the same way, I'll have to leave. I interrupted her outburst with a comforting embrace. Quiet now, I urged with conviction. Are you trying to make me stop caring for you? It's too late for that. Whatever you think you lack, it's irrelevant. You hold something far more precious, my heart. She seemed to faint at my words, and when she came to, she was in my arms, sharing a moment of tenderness and tears before drifting to sleep. Did the night lead to a whirlwind of romance? No. She was still vulnerable, so I just held her as she sobbed, carried her to my room, and made sure she was comfortable. Then I stepped outside, lost in thought under the starry sky, contemplating our future. Time slipped by as I stood there. When I returned inside, she had put on one of my shirts and was back in bed. As I joined her, she snuggled close, murmured a soft love you, and fell asleep once more. I stayed awake, holding her, feeling the warmth of her presence, until sleep finally took over. I woke up to the scent of breakfast. She was in the kitchen, meticulously preparing our meal. Surprising her with a gentle embrace, I kissed her neck, making her giggle after a moment of surprise. Be careful, love, or we'll end up with nothing but burnt breakfast. Post-breakfast, with the whole day ahead of us, we sat down to talk. She settled into my embrace. I do love you, she confessed, but I need time to heal from my past wounds. She recounted her life's journey, marked by moments of joy and despair. After her father's death, her mother's life unraveled, leading to a tumultuous childhood marred by neglect and danger. She bravely shared the hardships she faced, including a near assault and her subsequent years in the system, revealing struggles I hadn't known, including a younger sister she longed to protect. Her path had been fraught with manipulation and mistreatment, driving her to escape to a safer place, ultimately leading her here. My heart was heavy with longing for her. I really need you, Jace. I just can't seem to move past my fears. Can you help me? She asked. I did what I could, even arranging for a therapist to help her. Four months on, things had changed. We grew closer, more intimate, and she became comfortable enough to wear shorts and tank tops around the house, even opting for more revealing nightwear, a change from her usual attire. Amanda was never one for drinks, but she took a liking to wine, a gift from a client. One evening, after she'd had a bit to drink, she opened up completely. I proceeded with caution, focusing on her needs. I was gentle, starting with kisses and progressing slowly, paying attention to her neck, ears, and stomach. She was overwhelmed with emotion, reacting passionately to my touch. She stammered, that was, incredible, still catching her breath, and after a while, she took the lead, wanting to feel in control. Our connection was intense, and soon, she was fully immersed in the experience, expressing her emotions loudly. It was a night of letting go and being in the moment. She fell asleep, exhausted from the emotional and physical journey. The next morning, she playfully initiated another round of intimacy, suggesting a change in dynamics. During our time together, she experienced deep pleasure in various ways, expressing her delight vocally. The intensity of our connection was evident, and we both cherished the closeness. We decided to forego our usual bike ride, considering her comfort. The day unfolded leisurely until we got ready and headed out. She proudly claimed the dart as her car, and we ended up at the mall, where I steered her into a jewelry store, marking a new chapter in our journey together. Shoes, I suggested, standing in the glow of the engagement rings. Really? She gasped, tears streaming down her face. Absolutely, I replied, kneeling, this is why I suited up today. Marry me. After a teary yes and a moment of calm, she seemed to try on every ring we could afford in the store. She chose a simple design, not the priciest, but it was her favorite. Entering the bar, the atmosphere turned festive instantly. The women gathered together, leaving us men aside. What's happening? I inquired. The guys chuckled. 
their brainstorming wedding ideas, they said. Best heed this, not along to her wishes, budget allowing, and give them space. She dreamt of a church wedding. We found one nearby, with a condition, attend services for six weeks prior. This was beneficial. The reverend, wise and seasoned, encouraged a few premarital sessions. My past marital woes and her experiences surfaced. She wept for me, promising fidelity. We believed in it, joining the church semi-regularly. She joked it was an excuse to expand her dress collection, which she wore often, except for work to maintain financial independence. If you ever dislike my dresses, I'll stop wearing them, she teased. Now, her wardrobe fills a spare room. I vividly recall Amanda's walk down the aisle, her ivory lace dress accentuating her figure, her hair cascading in a lustrous wave. Helen played the bride's mother role, Sam walked her down the aisle. Fat boy was my best man. Colleagues and bar friends filled the seats, celebrating and escorting us to our honeymoon start. My mother adored Amanda, having longed for a daughter. Amanda, initially reserved, eventually formed a close bond, sharing a parting whisper that moved my mother to tears. On our way to the airport, I pondered their heartfelt exchange. I expressed gratitude to my mother-in-law, telling her I appreciated sharing her son with me and promised joy with future grandchildren, which seemed to brighten her day. The topic shifted as she hinted at her bridal attire, distracting me with playful secrecy. Our honeymoon destination was Belize, a fresh choice distinct from my previous experience in Cancun, aiming to create unique memories. It was Amanda's first journey abroad, a new adventure for her. We thoroughly enjoyed ourselves, exploring the beaches, where Amanda preferred the shade to protect her delicate skin, while her red hair glistened in the sunlight. Unexpectedly, she led me to a beach where more skin was shown than covered, confidently removing her wrap, leaving little to the imagination. She playfully remarked, Close your jaw, dear. I thought you'd appreciate a memorable scene like this, knowing you're the only one for me. The beach's warmth made it a frequent retreat for me, under the guise of cooling off. Amanda's figure was petite yet striking, capturing attention as we strolled by, even causing a stir among onlookers. Our nights were filled with passionate attempts to outdo each other's affection. As months passed, I encouraged her to leave her job to spend more time at home, which she reluctantly agreed to. Her mysterious grin hinted at something brewing. She pursued an education in hospitality and food management, a decision I supported despite not fully gracitating her choice. A sudden call from her one day, filled with urgency, prompted me to rush home. Her anxious demeanor and immediate embrace signaled something serious. Her tentative approach, asking if I truly loved her, filled me with a sense of foreboding. She sighed, taking my hand gently. I have something important to tell you, and a request to make. Please listen to everything before you respond. She had been searching for her sister for several weeks, yearning for a reunion. Now twelve, she hadn't seen her sister since she was four. The disparity between her current comfortable life and her memories of foster care weighed heavily on her mind. Firstly, I've found my sister, but she doesn't remember me, which was quite a blow. She bears a strong resemblance to our father. That's wonderful, dear. I'm sure she'll come around once she gets to know you better. Is she in a stable environment? Adopted. I'm eager for more details, and I'd love to meet my sister-in-law. My excitement grew, knowing her long-held desire for this reunion. A single tear rolled down her cheek. No, she replied, her voice tinged with sorrow, she wasn't adopted. I found her in dire circumstances, so severe they had to intervene and remove her and others from the situation. Where is she now? You haven't lost track of her again, have you? She embraced me. No, she's very close. Grasping my hand firmly, she continued, she's in the guest room. I was taken aback. After regaining my composure, I asked Amanda to bring her sister out. At twelve, she was already taller than Amanda, with black hair and a slightly broader nose, yet they shared many features like the same mouth, elegant neck, and expressive hands. Upon introduction, I extended my hand in greeting. It's wonderful to meet you, Celeste. Amanda speaks of you often. And where has she been all this time while I was enduring such hardships? Why didn't she find me sooner? I could have been here years ago. Her voice was filled with raw anger. Amanda quickly intervened. I'm here now, sweetheart. I came for you the moment I could. Four years back, I was struggling to manage my own life, let alone provide for an eight-year-old. I needed to get myself sorted out first. I understand your anger. Let's work together to improve things from here. Celeste was clearly frustrated. So, what now? I'm supposed to live with you two and play the perfect family role. Dress up and act all innocent. Please, I've seen enough to know how the world works. They shut down my last place for a reason. Men always have an agenda, and I'm not naive to it, she said, gesturing broadly to emphasize her point. Just watch, the moment you leave, he'll try to control me. How about we skip all the formalities? Give me some money, and we can call it a night. How does that sound? Her words hung heavily in the air. Amanda was speechless, and I was seething with anger. Perhaps we should offer you a place to sleep tonight and reconsider things in the morning. If you think you had it better before, then by all means, I said calmly. But let me make one thing clear, if we decide to help you, you need to show respect and drop the attitude. My priority is my wife's well-being, and I won't let anyone, including you, bring her pain. 
She's faced her own struggles. Maybe you should hear her out and find some compassion. Celeste's defiance seemed to falter for a moment, but she quickly regained her composure. I don't need your help or anyone else's. I'm fine on my own, she retorted. I nodded, understanding her stance, and turned to Amanda, embracing her. She began to tear up. I'm sorry, dear. I know you wanted to make this work. It's not your fault things are turning out this way. Maybe in time, she'll come around. After a pause, I addressed both of them, I'll start preparing dinner. You two should talk. Celeste, since you're here tonight, I expect some level of decency. And please, no more foul language. While I was grilling, keeping an eye on them through the window, their voices rose and fell. Amanda's tears were evident, and my heart ached for her. Then, a shift happened, and Celeste began to cry too, leading to a mutual embrace. Perhaps there was a chance for understanding. Dinner was quiet, with no further incidents. Celeste surprisingly ate well, and afterward, she even helped Amanda clean up. Later, they informed me they were going out to buy some necessities for Celeste, likely clothes. The evening's tensions seemed to ease, hinting at a possibility of reconciliation. I spent some time reflecting alone, pondering over a world that seemed indifferent to the well-being of the young. Their return cut through my thoughts, and surprisingly, Celeste came in laughing. After showing off her new pajamas, she bid us good night. Later, as we lay in bed, the conversation turned to her future with us. Can we keep her for a while? I'll take full responsibility, you won't even have to worry, Amanda proposed. I responded with a skeptical laugh, I find that hard to believe. But okay, she can stay on a temporary basis, provided she behaves. Amanda expressed her gratitude, relieved by my agreement. The authorities were more than willing to grant Amanda guardianship, considering her stable marriage, reputable neighborhood, and strong references. It surprised them when I inquired about Celeste's unclaimed social security benefits. After hiring a lawyer and completing the necessary paperwork, we secured the funds she was owed for the past eight years, plus a monthly allowance until she turned 18. We decided to invest this money in a college fund, accessible to her at 18 for education, or in full when she reached 21. Celeste, however, wasn't as thankful as we'd hoped, voicing her desire to access the funds earlier for a car. There's still time before that. Let's see how things unfold, I said, bearing the brunt of her frustration to ease the pressure on Amanda. Despite her initial defiance, including a grounding incident, Celeste gradually engaged more in her studies, encouraged by Amanda's incentives for good performance. During this period, my career was on an upward trajectory, highlighted by a successful marketing campaign for a winery, which led to further opportunities. My boss, fearing my potential departure due to external job offers, proposed a partnership deal. The arrangement allowed me to acquire shares in the company annually, matching my investment up to a certain percentage. After discussing it with Amanda, we agreed to the investment, appreciating our life and prospects here. Celeste ran away twice. The first escape lasted days until they found her at a distant bus station. Amanda was distraught during her absence. When Celeste returned, she was rebellious and resentful. I took a moment to speak with her privately and presented the harsh reality. You know, you could really be someone admirable if you allowed yourself. You seem intelligent enough to realize the kind of life waiting for you out there, full of hardship, health issues, and an early demise. Is that the future you envision? Let me put it straight. If you run away again, that's it. Once you're 16, in three years, I'll help you become legally independent, give you what you're entitled to financially, and bid you farewell. But Amanda is at her breaking point. Do you grasp what I'm saying? I think my words alarmed her. However, six months later, she didn't return from school. Upon her eventual return, she discovered the doors locked. Thankfully, Amanda was absent. I spoke to her through the closed door. Your belongings are packed. You can stay until the social services arrive. They're expected in about 45 minutes. I let her inside. She sat on the sofa, visibly shaken, and soon burst into tears, pleading for another chance. Please, I beg you, don't cast me out. I'll behave, I swear. My leaving was a mistake. I panicked when I got caught with smokers at school, leading to my suspension. It would devastate Amanda. I felt lost. Her aversion to smoking surprised me. Did you smoke? No, I was just with them, skipping class. Please, don't send me away. Celeste, look at me, I said, seeking her gaze. You need to realize that you have people who care about you. Amanda and I love you. We are here to guide and support you, to offer a stable and loving home. Let us help. You should have confided in us about your mistake. We would have been upset, sure, but our love for you is unwavering. Her tears flowed freely when I expressed my love, and she rushed into my arms, weeping intensely. That's when Amanda entered the room. What's the matter? She inquired with a hint of anxiety. Our daughter is just growing up, sweetheart. She made a mistake, got caught, came home, and confessed everything to me. I really think she's learned her lesson and feels remorseful. She'll explain it to you herself. Here she is. I passed her over and stepped outside, meeting the social worker at the mailbox. Hello, Denise. No need to worry, it was just a little mix-up. Our girl got into some trouble and ended up with a three-day suspension. It's nothing too grave, but she was scared to tell us. Amanda's with her now, trying to understand the whole story. 
They're inside if you want to check on them. She exhaled deeply. I probably should, but I trust your judgment. Now I can finally head home, cook dinner for Fred, and have a meal together as a family for once. Appreciate it, Denise, I replied, feeling a bit guilty for holding her up. How about joining us this Sunday? I'm planning to roast some pork. That sounds lovely, Jace, but it's homecoming at our church. We'll have a big feast there, why don't you all join? Plus, there's this friendly contest to see who can bring the most guests, and you could help me win. I agreed to discuss it with my family and went back inside. Who was that? That was Denise, dear. She stopped by to invite us to the homecoming service. Sounds nice, doesn't it? I'm up for it. They've got that new young pastor, right? He's quite charming. I'll call her to see what I can contribute. Celeste beamed at me. I attempted a serious look but couldn't keep it up. She jumped up from the couch. I know I'm grounded, but I can still go to church, can't I? Bobby Smith will be there, right? Celeste, you're only 13. There's plenty of time for boys later. If you and Bobby both show up, I swear the church might just light up with sparks. They both smiled at me, and with a playful huff, Celeste declared, boys, before heading off to assist her sister with the meal. In that moment, I felt a reassuring sense that our little family was going to be just fine. This week marked a significant milestone for our family. Celeste achieved honor roll status for the first time and was gearing up to learn driving during the summer, which admittedly filled me with anxiety. Amanda's graduation ceremony was a momentous occasion. She clutched her diploma as if it were a lifeline amidst tumultuous waves. Her speech, reflecting on her upbringing, her bond with her sister, and her journey of perseverance supported by our faith in her, moved everyone to tears. She expressed heartfelt gratitude towards me for my unwavering support and to Celeste for being an incredible sister. Keep faith, remain hopeful, and trust in your abilities. While you might not be as fortunate as I was, your efforts will make you a stronger individual. The following day, we hosted a celebratory barbecue, which saw our modest home bustling with guests. Among the attendees were close family members, friends from various circles, including work and community, and even Jack Edwards and his spouse, whom we assumed were abroad. Jack and his wife, who married later in life and remained childless, adored Amanda and later Celeste, showering them with affection and occasional treats. Their willingness to care for Celeste on weekends offered Amanda and me some personal space, often returning her with new clothes, courtesy of June's and my mother's generosity. I occasionally lamented Celeste's frequent absences, only to be gently chided by the family, reminding me of the positive impact we had on the girls' lives and suggesting humorously that expanding our family could balance the attention. During a tender moment, the women comforted an emotional Celeste, their whispers of reassurance filling the room. As the conversation turned to the future, the notion of having more children was playfully proposed, hinting at the joy it would bring to everyone's lives. Jack supported the idea with a smile, and as Celeste and I shared a prolonged embrace, I felt the weight of love and expectation mingling with the sweet nostalgia of the day's celebrations. We didn't visit the bar as often as before since having kids changed our priorities. However, I still managed to go there occasionally after work. Celeste always had activities that needed transportation, and Amanda stepped up as the supermom, ferrying her to band and soccer practices and matches. I couldn't be there for these activities, but I never missed her games. On a bright set afternoon, after a soccer match, I listened to Celeste and her teammates deciding on a place to celebrate their victory. She was starting to go out with groups, which made me a bit anxious, especially since they sometimes formed pairs during these outings. Amanda chuckled at my concern. You can't prevent her from growing up, dear. It's a good way for them to learn about socializing and eventually dating. Plus, most of their outings are supervised, except for the occasional movie or mall visit. She values your trust and wouldn't want to let you down. Following Amanda's graduation, we attended a church event. The kids were planning to get ice cream afterward, and as I approached, Amanda said, Here's your dad now. Ask him if you can go. Celeste gave me a pleading look. Dad, may I go with Mrs. Jenkins and my friends for ice cream? I was unexpectedly emotional and nodded, handing her a $20 bill. She squealed with joy, took the money, and ran off, shouting, Bye, Mom, bye, Dad. I'll be back by 7. Driving home, Amanda and I realized we had naturally taken on the roles of Mom and Dad. It's just simpler, she said with a smile, and you've always been like a parent to me. I like it. I felt the same way. Later, our friend Sam experienced a minor stroke, which forced him to reduce his work hours. Everyone helped out, but it became clear that Helen was struggling to cope. Amanda approached me after church one Sunday, suggesting we take a ride as Celeste was out with her friends. Before we leave, I need to discuss something with you. Please, hear me out first. It means a lot to me. I was anxious about what she might say. I cherish being Celeste's mother and your partner. But, Helen is seeking assistance, and I'm eager to utilize my education. After discussing with Helen and Sam, they're supportive. I want to rejoin the cafe, not as a staff member, but as a co-owner. Helen will manage the place, with Sam's assistance. I'll be in charge of the culinary side. Could you consider it? 
While we traveled, I mulled it over. Arriving at the cafe, I viewed it differently. It looked fine, yet it could benefit from some enhancements. Helen approached, and Amanda headed to the kitchen. What's your opinion? It's a lot to ponder. I'm wary about the possibility of the business consuming too much of our time. Considering my experiences, I'm cautious about our time mismatch, not to mention thinking of Celeste. Also, the financial aspect is crucial. Though, I'll likely agree, she knows I hardly deny her anything. Helen reassured me gently. Don't worry, dear. She's planned thoroughly to ensure she's not away too much, especially after the initial phase and training are complete. She's ambitious, and even Sam and I are excited. We then deliberated further. I had entrusted the finances to her, given her adeptness at managing them. While I had a broad overview, she predominantly handled our expenditures. Our vehicles were fully paid off, including the three-year-old minivan, essential for transporting Celeste and her friends. We had purchased our home after leasing it. Though modest, it met our needs, and our significant initial payment meant our mortgage was minimal. I had acquired a 4% stake in my company and was earning well. Our savings were substantial, so the investment source was clear. Eventually, we acquired a 30% share in the cafe. We invested in its refurbishment, enhanced the kitchen facilities, and celebrated its grand reopening. Business quickly improved. The regulars appreciated the revamped look of their favorite spot, and newcomers enjoyed the ambience. The establishment now opened at 11 to cater to the lunch crowd. Amanda transformed the kitchen. The basic burgers and fries were upgraded with new, fancier options. Burgers now came with a variety of toppings like avocado slices, hot peppers, spinach, and four types of cheese. The hot dogs were revamped too, with a particularly popular version featuring grilled onions, mushrooms, spicy mustard, and dill relish. Instead of regular fries, the menu now boasted home fries, thinly sliced and marinated overnight in different flavors. Amanda introduced homemade soups to the menu, such as potato with cheese and bacon bits, creamy tomato, and a hearty pork stew filled with herbs. A new addition was a large gas grill, perfect for seasonal grilled vegetables. Amanda was keen on supporting local farmers, evident from a large chalkboard by the kitchen door listing the day's suppliers for vegetable and meats. This initiative was a hit with the farmers. Initially skeptical, the regular customers soon engaged in lively debates over the best farm produce and the perfect seasoning for each dish. It was amusing to see intense debates, especially among the more robust patrons, about the superior choice between pumpkin and butternut squash soup. Amanda also curated a wine selection from local vineyards, with Jack's Vineyard as the highlight. Due to state regulations banning wine service in establishments with pool tables, the pool area was replaced with additional dining tables, a change well received by Helen and Sam, as it also reduced altercations. Helen negotiated an exclusive deal to serve a local brewery's beer on draft. The place caught the attention of a local food critic, leading to an unexpected but glowing review. The headline read, The Best Hidden Jewel in the State, praising Sam's Bar and Grill for its significant transformation under the new co-owner Amanda Gooding. Located on Swan Pond Road, just outside the city, this 75-year-old establishment had gained newfound popularity, making it a bustling spot despite the regulars' preference for its previous, quieter days. From blue-collar workers to students, everyone mingles pleasantly here. The only debate I recall was between two customers arguing about whether rosemary or basil should dominate the pork stew. I supported the rosemary advocate, partly because of his imposing presence. The restaurant offers straightforward, well-seasoned dishes at a fair price. The service shines, the ambience is inviting, and the place is exceptionally clean, boasting a near-perfect health score. Mrs. Gooding assured me they're on track to achieve the highest rating soon. Located just outside the city, the establishment serves only beer and wine. Helen Connors, who co-owns the place with her husband Sam, prefers it this way and has no plans to change, even if future regulations allow for more. The bar area, reminiscent of a classic saloon, showcases local and national beverages. The knowledgeable staff can guide you through the selection of beers and wines. Despite its secluded location, it's a gem worth visiting. Each of my visits has been rewarding in terms of food quality and service. I must insist you try the banana pudding, it's exceptional and a personal favorite. When Amanda and Helen exchanged knowing smiles, it became clear they had no idea who the enthusiastic patron was, mistaking him for a curious customer. Amanda made it a point to join Celeste and me for dinner whenever we visited. As Celeste grew, she expressed interest in working there, an idea I fully supported given the family-friendly environment. The establishment was popular, especially on Thursdays when motorcycle enthusiasts gathered, leading to an expansion to accommodate the growing clientele. I had acquired an 8% stake in our business by then. Celeste, at 16, started working there part-time, keen on honing her culinary skills with aspirations to attend culinary school post-high school. She was keen on the dart, but giving a 16-year-old something so fast was out of the question. Amanda was approaching 26, and the idea of starting our family was on the horizon. She was on board but preferred to wait until Celeste graduated to focus on the new addition. 
Celeste overheard our discussion and chimed in, Mom, I'm not a kid anymore. I can manage. Maybe it's time for a sibling, so Dad can enjoy being around for them too. Her point seemed sensible, yet Amanda chuckled, suggesting we'd revisit the discussion later. Meanwhile, our business was on the rise. The marketing strategy I crafted for Jack had attracted more clients from the local beverage sector. We'd taken on additional wineries and breweries, and a burgeoning distillery was showing interest in our services. At a regional conference, I unexpectedly reunited with an old acquaintance, Ada, after years apart. She retained her striking presence, enhanced by the years. I approached her unnoticed, teasing about old times. Surprised but delighted, she hugged me back, expressing how much she'd missed our conversations. Over coffee, she shared her recent hardships, including her divorce after discovering her husband's infidelity. He had strayed, and despite attempts at reconciliation, his affair led to a pregnancy, ending their marriage abruptly. I offered a sympathetic ear, inquiring if she had someone special in her life now. No, it seems premature, I believe. I've been contemplating a change, my firm was taken over, and the new management isn't to my liking. I presume they retain me solely due to my proficiency in my role. A fresh start is definitely on my horizon. I smiled at her, presenting a business card. Have you considered moving to the sun-drenched south? Ponder over it and ring me up. To my astonishment, she accepted the card. As we were about to part ways, she inquired about my personal life. I raised my hand to show my wedding ring. Every single day, I feel blessed for the life I've crafted. I'm surrounded by a loving wife, a wonderful daughter, a fulfilling career, and a circle of genuinely kind friends. Take a look. I produced photos of Amanda and Celeste, and she viewed them with amazement. How did you manage to find such a stunning partner? And your daughter, she's her spitting image except for the hair. And she seemed so youthful. Was she a child when she had her? I chuckled and clarified. Her embrace was warm and sincere, a reflection of her happiness for me. It only struck me later, but the topic of Becky never surfaced in our conversation. Two months down the line, my supervisor summoned me, sliding a resume across. Review this. She mentioned you as a reference, even credited you with her training. Is she proficient? I inspected it and beamed. While I may have mentored her, she's innately talented. At this point, she's outshining me. We'd be foolish to pass on her if she's within our budget. He acknowledged with a nod. Then bring her on board, and she'll report to you. But now, there's a grave matter we need to address. I haven't disclosed this to anyone, and it must remain confidential. He paused, collecting his thoughts. I'm unwell, John Charles. It's grave. A tumor in my brain, recently detected, necessitates urgent removal, or it's fatal. The survival odds are uncertain. Gloria and I have concurred that you should steer the company during my recovery, or take the helm permanently should the need arise. Either way, it's imperative to sustain the firm's stability until Gloria resolves her future actions. It certainly stirred things up in our group when he shared the news. He and Jack had been inseparable for years. On the day of his operation, everyone from our office, including Gail, showed up. All his friends came too. He personally asked each of us to visit his room for a potential farewell. Ken, June, Amanda, Celeste, and I took turns comforting Gloria. When we weren't with her, we were in the chapel, joining his other friends in prayer. The surgery lasted five hours. Upon seeing the doctor, everyone was anxious. He's stable for now. I'm optimistic about his recovery. He'll be up for visitors by tomorrow. Relief washed over us, we laughed and shed tears, expressing gratitude to the medical staff and the divine. Ada quickly became an integral part of our team, essentially my go-to person. Amanda and Celeste adored her, and she seamlessly merged into our friendship circle. The matchmaking began shortly after, as it often does among married friends towards the single ones. Ada resisted, claiming she wasn't ready for a relationship. She became a regular at the bar, quickly befriending the regulars, bolstered by her connection to us. The day she agreed to join a poker run with a friend was memorable. He was a large, bearded, Caucasian man, yet one of the kindest individuals I've ever encountered. Children were naturally drawn to him, surrounding him eagerly in social settings. His wife, however, was manipulative and unfaithful, which devastated him upon discovery. She demeaned him, and her new partner underestimated him. Sam and I helped him legally and supported him through the ordeal, but the emotional toll was evident. Eighteen months on, he hadn't considered dating again. Ada, taking us by surprise, agreed to go on a date before the poker run, which went remarkably well, judging by their beaming smiles. Eight months later, she flaunted an elegant ring and was expecting. My life veered in a new direction when Alice Johnson approached us about a campaign proposal. Her being proactive was unusual, as clients seldom come with solid plans, often too attached to their ideas. I typically referred such clients elsewhere to avoid the fallout of unmet expectations. Alice was a manager for athletes, notably Bettina Bang Bang Burke, now Stewart, a middleweight MMA fighter and world champion in her division. The initiative wasn't about her, but rather a cause we all championed. Initially reluctant, I finally consented to discuss it. Ada and I greeted her at the terminal, shared a meal, and listened to her proposal. I must confess, it was impressively inventive. 
After refining the idea and conducting some market research, we embraced it fully. Consequently, advertisements began surfacing, predominantly in print and on billboards. The concept was a creative spin on the famous Got Milk campaign, substituting milk with the theme of love. Got Love became the rallying cry for the National Adoption Coalition, an alliance of organizations committed to finding nurturing homes for children. This initiative gained nationwide traction. The advertisements showcased celebrities who were adopted, alongside groups of children from various backgrounds typically set in their hometowns. Each ad included a call to action to consider adoption, supported by local dairy contributions to children's homes correlating with each successful adoption, and even incorporated the iconic milk mustache. Before long, notable figures from various fields, rock and country musicians, athletes, business leaders, actors, Olympians, and Nobel laureates, all of whom were adopted, eagerly offered their support. We highlighted many alongside their adoptive families, some of whom had pursued adoption themselves. Betty and Mark Stewart, the brains behind this concept, were photographed with their newly adopted child, becoming a crowd favorite. This campaign led my agency, High Country Advertising, to receive a national accolade. Howard, my superior, unable to travel, delegated the acceptance duties to Ada and me. Naturally, her spouse Roy and Amanda accompanied us. Attending the ceremony was a fulfilling experience. During our acceptance speech, we extended an apology and recognition to Alice Johnson, whom we invited on stage, for adopting her concept and expressed our gratitude to her and the audience for the acknowledgement. The subsequent mixer was lively. Ada and I had a playful wager on who would receive more proposition. I lost with nine against her sixteen and jokingly requested steak and eggs as my consolation breakfast. As the evening wound down, I was searching for Amanda, who had stepped out with Ada, when I encountered Becky. Her expression was a mix of apprehension and uncertainty. Hello, Jace. How are you? She greeted me, her tone revealing a tinge of nervousness. I observed her closely. She still possessed her beauty, albeit with a few changes, a bit more weight, drastically shorter hair, and seemingly plumper lips, yet she remained the enchanting woman I once adored. I'm fine, Beck. How about you? She gestured nonchalantly. I'm managing. Congrats on your award, and it was nice seeing Ada again. She mentioned she's associated with your business now. I clarified subtly, she collaborates with me. I'm a part owner and the current head of High Country Advertising. I joined after everything happened. I enjoy the work, the locale, and the community. Her gaze dropped to my hand. It appears you've found a special someone. I couldn't tell if it pained her, but I smiled, touching my ring. Indeed, I have. And I noticed you have someone significant, judging by the impressive ring. She fiddled with her ring, a sign of unease. Yes, I'm settled now. But tell me, Jace, in the quiet of night, do you ever reminisce about us? If you had forgiven me, we might still be together. I exhaled deeply. There was a time when you filled my thoughts. However, after meeting Amanda, those memories became sporadic flashes. You haven't been forgotten. Certain moments do bring back the joy we shared, but they are brief. She suddenly clasped my hand. Let's make a new start. I'd walk away from him if you'd accept me again. My feelings for you never faded. We were destined for each other. I felt a sharp gasp from behind as I gently freed my hand. No, Beck. If destiny was on our side, betrayal would never have occurred, and I wouldn't have met Amanda. She embodies love and loyalty more than you ever did. I'm sorry, Becky. I wish you well. As I began to walk away, I felt a delicate hand intertwine with mine. Who's your friend, dear? Amanda inquired, her smile forced and polite. This is Becky, someone from my past in the old town. Becky, meet my wife, Amanda. There was no handshake, just an intense exchange of looks, as if they were silently competing. Observing them, Becky appeared in her mid-thirties, dressed simply in black, while Amanda, youthful at twenty-six, radiated with her green dress complimenting her eyes and her copper-red hair flowing elegantly. I felt incredibly fortunate to have them in my life. Amanda, breaking the silence, turned to me with a smile. Darling, could we perhaps retire early to our room? I'm feeling a bit unwell this evening. She paused, covering her mouth with a giggle. Oh dear, I was hoping to surprise you later. But now's as good a time as any. Surprise, we're expecting a boy. Behind me, I heard a sharp intake of breath, but my focus shifted entirely to Amanda. Holding her close, we shared a moment of joy, tears mixing with laughter. The celebration at the bar was lively, with Amanda expressing her gratitude. Back at home, her demeanor changed as she firmly grasped my arm, ensuring she had my undivided attention. I need to be clear about something. I'm aware of your recent conversation in New York. Promise me, never again will you be seen with that woman, understood. Feeling the seriousness of her grip, I promised sincerely. She then softened, whispering appreciatively, Thank you, love. And I know what you said to her, it was genuinely touching. Remember, you're gonna need those balls. I still want that girl. My comment. Becky was an easy woman before marriage so OP is a fool to think the skank would change. 